So, good morning, everyone, and <laughs> thank you for coming uh, at Parasite for the for the last day of the uh, exhibition, uh, A Beast Caught in the Line, and uh, more importantly, the separate but nevertheless related in many different ways uh, seminar uh, as part of the Perverse Decronization Project. Uh, this project uh, was initiated by Ekaterina Begos and David Riff. Ekaterina is with us today and she will uh, give a lengthier introduction of the premises of the project, of like, its structure and uh, its premises. Um, it is, well, just in brief, it's a, a project that is realized by a network of institutions around the world that Paris is also part of, um, looking at uh, different uh, issues related to the different processes of decolonization that are happening and are claimed uh, around the world. And something that of course is uh, of particular relevancy for our context in Hong Kong and for many other uh, contexts across Asia. And uh, the speakers of today will uh, primarily speak about uh, this geography, but obviously placing it in a, uh, in a, in a global um, conversation that of course is apt for uh, given the, uh, the nature of this uh, all-encompassing phenomenon. Um, yes, so we will be speaking the whole afternoon. Um, if you have, if you haven't like, seen the exhibition, do uh, uh, make sure to catch uh, the last uh, glimpses of it uh, during the breaks uh, because it ends at 7 o'clock at the same time as our conference. Uh, and yes, I will invite Ekaterina uh, to the microphone. Thank you, Kostman. Um, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, it's my, not for the first time in Hong Kong, and not the first time in Parasite, but the first time in this uh, wonderful new place of Parasite. And I'm also very glad that I had the chance to see the show. Uh, which is incredibly rich and stimulating uh, and <clears throat> answers actually some of the questions we are asking in our project. Uh, the project is uh, purely discursive. Uh, it consists of uh, talks and will continue with more talks and will en end up in a publication. Uh, it was indeed initiated in the institution which, which is called Academy of Arts of the World in Cologne in Germany. Uh, the name of this institution is misleading. So many people assume it's, an, it's a school, or even in Germany, an academy mostly means some art school, but it is not. It is academy in the sense like Académie Française, so it has international members uh, of uh, all disciplines. First of those members were nominated by the city of Cologne, and then members were nominating themselves. Uh, and there is also, besides this international body of members, where I also belong, and uh, my co-curator, David Reif, uh, too, uh, there is an institution in the city of Cologne that has a small exhibition space uh, and it organizes um, something which we can call an ongoing festival of different events, uh, but many of them uh, discursive. And the, um, general line of this institution is uh, related to their post-colonial uh, discourse, which is new in Germany, uh, that not, was not really developed. The first uh, historical exhibition about Germany's colonial uh, power uh, just took place in the German Historical Museum of Berlin last year, or two years ago. Um, and that was like the very first time uh, where um, it was actually acknowledged uh, that there was uh, a colonial past in Germany and uh, there is actually an ongoing uh, debate about finan possible, uh, possible financial retribution, so it's also quite a hot political topic. Uh, anyway, even besides that, uh, strictly historical issue of German colonialism, uh, which is actually related to German Nazi past. And the reason, one of the reasons actually the German colonialism is not getting a high profile, uh, because the society kind of 
probably feels that it's enough, you know, the Nazi history of Germany, there is enough of uh, some problematic issues, but those issues are actually related. And uh, their um, plans of, um, like militarist uh, plans of uh, uh, Nazis in Germany were directly related uh, to a colonial project. It's well known that one of them, uh, I forgot whom actually said, that, uh, okay, we, why do we should not renew this colonialist project in Africa uh, because it's too far away, too kind of complicated, too much of a headache, we have the whole Eastern <laughs> Europe here. Uh, so for that, uh, and so that was actually uh, explicitly um, uh, one of the agendas of uh, World War II. Uh, so, um, Besides that colonial history, uh, what else uh, is very topical in Germany is, of course, migration. Uh, the migration of, uh, which started in, on a massive scale in the 70s with Gastarbeiter from Turkey, uh, who represent a, a very significant part of uh, German society. It was actually meant that those people would not remain in Germany. The idea was that they will come to work in, in the moment where German economy needed them most, and then they will come back to Turkey. That actually did not happen. That instead of that, they brought their families, and they became part of society, uh, while uh, for long decades being totally apart. It's actually also interesting that Germany and Turkey do not really share common history besides being actually uh, allies uh, in some of the wars, but the no, no colonial history directly. So it, uh, this lack of common past actually made it a relatively peaceful um, cohabitation uh, <coughs> till the moment uh, where, of course, uh, Turkish uh, citizens of uh, Germany started to reclaim uh, also uh, <coughs> symbolic presence and uh, the right uh, to be part uh, of uh, this new diverse society. This is actually what is happening on the media level uh, in Germany, but still uh, not um, also with the new waves of refugees. Uh, it uh, raises lots of questions, and uh, precisely where I, I've been at the time, the artistic director of this academy in Köln, uh, this um, um, a New Year night uh, scandal happened, which you might have heard about, where on the main square of Köln, uh, some people who might have been Syrian immigrants, but it's actually not clear because that uh, um, police investigation is still not over, uh, started not just to steal wallets, uh, which normally of course happens on the New Year's night in this very crowded, very small, uh, square in the center of Poland, they also started to aggressively grab women and allegedly uh, they specifically targeted white German women. And so as I say, it's still not clear what happened, who, who were those people and how it was like organized, if it was organized, but the German press immediately started to react uh, with extremely racist um, um, statements and advertisement and all all the memory of the um, events. Uh, you can take, uh, of course, you can take my stuff for, for my chair. I um, So this was the context, uh, but in this context, uh, the project was initiated uh, in general frame of dealing with those issues of post-colonialism and uh, bringing uh, discussions with uh, 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 I don't know, Iraqi writer who lives in Cologne as an emigre writer for 20 years and was absolutely not acknowledged till the very last uh, years, or some Syrian rappers uh, who are were um, political refugees in Berlin, all bringing some, I don't know, African dancers uh, who live in Paris uh, partly as illegals. So this was like the typical, I would say, things we were doing. Uh, in uh, Köln, besides of, uh, besides of exhibitions also of um, artists, also from artists of uh, Cologne. But we, um, me and David Reif, uh, so I'm from uh, Russia, uh, David Reif uh, has spent more than 10 years in Russia, we uh, knew each other very well and worked uh, together many years, 
And being from that context outside Western Europe, at least partly, we were interested also in critical view of um, some discursive processes. And this is uh, how this project of perverse decolonization uh, was born. Uh, this is a catchy title uh, which encompasses uh, different things uh, about emancipative processes that either recently either went wrong or were misused. In general, we are witnessing an enormous and extremely positive wave of um, decolonizing the art scene. So in contemporary art, I would say it happened already several years ago, maybe even more than a decade ago, then artists uh, from uh, India, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, other countries, of course, uh, Latin America as well, Africa, more and more started to be part of international biennials and documenta, uh, so is the document, documenta of Wayne Weather, but there were also some exhibitions even before that were in contemporary art, but then even the museum scene is also slowly changing. This process is uh, going uh, very actively and very quickly, and that is already happening. But uh, also on a discursive level, many things are happening, uh, but at the same time, it is spreading out in the media sphere or in the sphere of public, um, uh, public consciousness, yes, so to speak. And this is where we can see this misuse or the process when, uh, which goes wrong. The misuse is obviously when um, this decolonizing thinking is starts to be seen as a, some sort of a know-how that can be also used uh, for actually dominant groups that present themselves uh, as also minorities. This is obviously their um, strategy of alt-right uh, in the uh, US, but also the so-called identitarians uh, that are very strong in Europe and in particular in Austria where I live now. So there is a, a group of uh, uh, white ethnically Austrian, if something like that is at all possible because the country is very mixed. Uh, people, but who believed in this, uh, you know, myth of um, racial purity again, um, and who pretend uh, and claim that there are actually a minority in this country where there are also all other minority, and why wouldn't we also benefit from the same from same rights, and we also have a right to uh, our culture, and. That is actually logical, I would say logical uh, result of the multiculturalist uh, you know, structure, how it is being, how it is being thought uh, by, uh, in, in uh, Europe. Or let's say it started with Milosevic in uh, Serbia, but this is precisely the same ideology which is being uh, put on the table in Russia uh, with Vladimir Putin, uh, this uh, presenting itself as a victim of Western cultural hegemony uh, and um, pretending, uh, to, pretending to be a victim and as a victim claiming those victims' rights of uh, this alleged, uh, alleged suppression of uh, something or sensing which was never defined what it actually would be. Uh, so that is uh, misuse, but then there are also uh, some moments when uh, it kind of this process kind of goes uh, wrong by itself, uh, so to speak, uh, and we start to feel awkward from um, in a situation of those increasing um, particularities. So this landscape of um, contemporary, you know, contemporary intellectual landscape is more and more structured as landscape of identities, again, so everybody is supposed to be an identitarian of one or another kind, and kind of, uh, in the first place, uh, present, uh, present their uh, identity of such and such uh, community, which is mostly understood as ethnic community. So some of the participants of our project, and I'll return to its structure in a bit, uh, were uh, right to stress that in this structure the notion of class uh, become is erased in favor of uh, ethnic identities, and uh, the difference between them is uh, between those um, views and the, the, the system of identity. You are supposed to 
uh, cherish and be proud of your identity and be proud of it, while uh, in the classic uh, Marx uh, vision of things, the poor uh, do not, are not proud of being poor, and, not, and they don't, do not wish to remain poor. Uh, they wish to change this, this thing, this situation. So that's the difference in the view and the identities landscape is that it aims at changing things. Like identity landscape is actually aims at preserving things more or less as they are, and even increasing those roots that keep you in place. Uh, so these were things that were like sources of annoyance, uh, so to speak, uh, for many of us participants of those projects. No, how the project is organized. So we invited uh, several institutions uh, to take part in this discussion, and um, Parasite is one of them. Uh, among uh, others, uh, there is Anna Kuyazdowski uh, in uh, Warsaw, a Center of Contemporary Art in Holon near Tel Aviv. Wurtemberg uh, Kunstverein in Stuttgart, uh, University of Chicago. Uh, and um, there were also individual researchers invited uh, to the first uh, meeting that took place in Köln uh, last year. Uh, and uh, then there are individual meetings with other people, not the same group of people, but each time uh, new. Uh, and uh, we are accumulating uh, those conversations on videos and uh, in reports, and there will be another bigger meeting in Cologne again in the autumn of this year, and it all will result in a publication in a book uh, where maybe some of our conversations or maybe some totally new authors uh, will contribute uh, to uh, the topic. Uh, which uh, is somewhere in between, as you see, theoretical thinker, thinking, and there are specialists in post-colonial theory, but also sociologists in our projects, but then there are also art people. I'm also a curator, and uh, David Riffa as well, curator as well as an artist, and um, specifically, we are interested specifically how that functions in the field of contemporary art, which, as I said, is uh, in advance on, uh, many, on many positions. Uh, we already had interesting preliminary conversations here yesterday, and I'm very much looking forward to today's session. I learned a lot. Uh, I discovered how the, uh, I learned more about the context of Hong Kong in particular, and how this um, situation of being uh, post-colonial, in a post-colonial or maybe neo-colonial situations is uh, um, uh, coming together. Also, how does it affect, uh, we will be hopefully talking about how it affects uh, art uh, representation. Uh, we had uh, discussions about how in principle, can, can we in principle hope to get rid of uh, colonial uh, inequalities in a new system that would be truly egalitarian and where the violence would be erased. And there were some positions where it was seen as possible, desirable, but for that we have to get rid of many, many things and structures that seem so uh, impossible to change in the Western view of things, in particular museum representation. Or there were also other positions uh, that we heard that this violence is actually cannot be erased and the colonizing process brings more or at least as much violence as uh, it was in colonial time and even brings some of the colonial violence more, uh, what makes it more visible. We also discussed but did not come to the, to the conclusion um, how can we position in relation to each other, the issue of colonialism and the issue of imperialism. Is it the same or is it not? Uh, and of uh, what can we uh, talk in our respective uh, situations uh, in our countries um, all over the world? Um, so I guess I can introduce us to, introduce us to the very interesting entanglement of issues uh, we are uh, having here. We'll uh, hear about um, particular cases, case studies, or maybe even more of an overview. Uh, and um, since I'm new here, it will be Cosmin who will be introducing particular speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Mina, for your uh, introduction of the project and the summary of the discussions we had yesterday. So I would like to introduce Clara Chang, who is an artist and a curator and a co-founder co with Gamjan of uh, CNG Apartment. And um, yeah, her recent editing and curatorial practice looks into the possibilities to connect, connect humanities from different ages in the form of performance, art, and time-based media. Uh, so, Clara, please, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Carson. Thank you. Thank you, uh, And um, actually, from yesterday, I learned that uh, I am one of the two uh, in the panel who um, admit that I am an artist. <laughs> so I'm also still interested in art. So I, today, I uh, take this privilege um, to actually uh, share something a bit, maybe a bit more emotional in a sense, in the artistic sense. And then I leave the really tough theories to the others in the later on our sessions. Uh, um, um, actually, I would like to actually begin with a story. The story of the museum in Hong Kong. Um, I I actually read this a really long time ago by Christina Chu, um, who was the previous chief curator uh, of the Hong Kong Museum of Art. But yeah, uh, it impressed me quite a lot because I did not know about this history of the museum in Hong Kong before that. Um, so today I share this to begin with. So the first museum in Hong Kong was established uh, in 18, uh, 1869. Uh, under the colonial rule. Uh, yeah, this is the old picture. And you can also find it online in the open dialogue catalog from the museum. Um, yeah, and this is also the location where the HKS Shanghai Bank yeah. now is located. Yeah, um, what is really interesting is that uh, there are actually two different uh, interpretations or uh, opinions about this museum. One is actually a report uh, presented to the British government in 1938. Described it as a you know, place for the odds and ends from every corner of the globe, a collection of the Australian parrot, the old clocks, etc. Et it's really random and uh, it's not systematic. It's not up to the good quality of what we see. But then the other account was actually um, by Bob Zhenghe, the diplomatic um, from the late Qing Dynasty. Um, he first visited Hong Kong in 1870, after British rule for 28 years. Actually, this is his comment. He wrote in Chinese. This is uh, the English translation. He thought that it is actually not a public institute with a new world view and also new priority in humanistic order, right? You know, this, this is the place to share knowledge with the public. And of course, um, I imagine he was probably supportive to the reformation of the Qing Dynasty in order to make it hopefully more like modern. But then, so I think this story also um, uh, raises another question about the imagination of modern and civilization. And, yeah, but, um, of course, it also is about the representation of the museum. And, and I uh, came, yeah, it, this story came into my mind when, um, um, when I heard about the story about the, uh, how the Thailand, in Thailand, the, the king, uh, in a really early on day, actually opened up uh, the museum to, to showcase his own private collection in order to actually uh, as a museum in order to um, show to the world how modern it already has been so that it doesn't really need colonization <laughs> right but then on the other hand if you really think about it um, it's probably as another kind of self-colonization so this is uh, one story that came into my mind from yesterday's discussion yeah, so he also mentioned in his writing that oh, this is such a grand institution, but then it is only possible 
with the support of an actually strong and low of government. And I think we all understand why <laughs> we had that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so just a little bit uh, of the fact check for you. Um, so it was demolished in 33, and then uh, the uh, Hong Kong City Hall High Block Gallery mm -hmm. Museum was established in 62. So there's a gap in between that where we didn't really have the museum. At least and we had the HSBC. Oh, yeah, yeah, we had the bank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 91, the Museum of Art uh, in Chin was established. Um, so, the, so with this museum story, I want to develop a little bit more by looking into one passage from the web page of the Hong Kong Museum of Art about Hong Kong modern art. Actually, at the very beginning of this, uh, before this paragraph, this still has one sentence about describing Hong Kong uh, developed from a shipping village, a sh yeah, fishing village. Yeah, and then until nowadays, the financial center. Very interesting, because we did have farmers, you know, in the old days as well. But then the focus usually will be about the, the sea, the fishing village. Um, okay, so over here, about the Hong Kong modern art, it is actually really emphasized. Uh, the new ink painting movement uh, was emphasized. And what is it about? It's attempt to introduce new ideas and techniques into traditional ink painting to enrich its means of expression and use the Western media to convey the essence of Chinese cultures. Um, if you have, yeah, uh, if you are familiar with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the, the history of Hong uh, the culture and history of Hong Kong, you probably have also heard about Zhong Sai Dong. We always, we always emphasize uh, how the East and the West media should be mixed. Uh, this is it forms Hong Kong. You know? So it also is you know part of this narrative. So just to quickly, probably you all know uh, you all know about it, but then just give you some really quick visual. So the new in the new ink art movements. Uh, this is uh, also from the. Um, in the collection of the Museum of Art. There is our women's painting, one or ten. And also um, the female artists in the movement, one of the few. Mm. Um, I mean, also sculpture, not uh, one of them. Uh, this is uh, representing the and blue in the wind. <laughs> but, okay, so, <laughs> but there's always the forgotten part yeah, in the grand narrative. And I think it is really nice that in the past, uh, let's say 10 to 20 years, we do have more scholars in Hong Kong to try to rediscover those history, the hidden history. So this um, artist of Ma Zha Bao, Ma Ga Bo, Ma Zha Bao, um, was in, um, written and researched by um, the, this uh, MA's, uh, yeah, master's student at Visual Studies Department of Yunnan University in 2010. Um, I'll show you some works first and then you will know. So this is, yeah, this works. And later on, and this one as well, and uh, in, in, in the research paper, it also compared this oil painting with uh, the owners. Mm. So this is more, let's say, the, he's actually a, uh, his background uh, was a leftist, um, actually trying to also make use of the Soviet or let's say the realistic uh, socialist, sorry, socialist style of painting to uh, express his ideas about the society, about the realistic uh, society, about the workers, about the farmers, about the hardship of such. I mean, this is. Uh, uh, his, the subject matter he's interested in and also the, um, the painting style this okay so the story went on and um, in 19 after 1967 he actually um, okay 67 or uh, uh, it was the year of the uh, riots uh, in Hong Kong uh, with uh, the support of uh, the Communist Party from the China uh, to support the locals in Hong Kong. And, but then at the very beginning, it was uh, 
uh, strike uh, and factory, but you can yeah, also research a bit more about it if you're interested. But anyway, so he actually wanted to put up a show at the City Hall, Hong Kong uh, City Hall, a solo exhibition. But because um, in the research paper, um, it stated that because of one of the paintings, actually it's this one, although it's not very clear, yeah, um, it is, this man supposedly is holding a newspaper um, with the title about the, um, some of the agenda of the Cultural Revolution. And actually it's because of this painting, um, Madaba or Solo Exhibition has to be cancelled. Yeah, it, uh, anyway, it's uh, a kind of censorship. And like, maybe to the uh, older generation, it's not very uh, uh, worth, <coughs> but maybe <coughs> to, to see as well. <coughs> But, um, so this is one of the part of it, and later on, actually Madaba actually also had his uh, style and uh, changed. Um, probably after the Cultural Revolution, he got more um, unsatisfied with the uh, Chinese government in the mainland, and he kind of moved away a bit more. And this really. Um, political position in his work. So you can see, but later on, he still wants to focus on you know, the daily life. This is uh, the subject matter he really would be interested in. Um, okay, so going back to the, you know, the grand narrative about the Zhong Sai Yong Hao, Western Chinese idea, and then forming the Hong Kong art and Hong Kong people. Um, yeah, so the, the question of uh, the invisibility of Ma Zhabao is, well, so why would certain kind of arts be supported by the government's museum? And also really well, um, the history of it will be really well written, but not the other kind. Yeah, so, mm. And of course, I, as an artist myself, I also feel uh, sympathetic toward him. Um, okay, and then, but then I think this kind of um, really important kind of agenda changed along the way. Um, and more more young artists in Hong Kong in the 80s, I think it didn't really have this burden of investigating into how to mix the two cultures together. And I don't have the answer to why. Maybe because of the contemporary art. Uh, uh, inspiration, or maybe because everyone already, I mean, if you are already the product of this hybridity, then you don't really need to produce anything to show the hybridity, because you are already the product. Um, and there are so many different examples you can find, but uh, uh, because this show is also quite uh, discussed a lot nowadays, so I show a little, there are some images from this exhibition. Um, in 1987, to just sh to show you, you, you know, the change of the art form and how artists um, using different kind of media in response to um, the situation of the, contem uh, of the contemporary world. Um, actually, this was a show um, in the Ghost House Wai Oka. The ghost house, and initiated originally by uh, a group of artists who used that ghost house as their studio. So it's sort of like open open studio. Yeah, so they show their works in their open studio, and um, you should all probably should also know that at that time, um, Hong Kong only would have the Hong Kong Museum of Art, the City Hall Museum, City Hall Galleries, and then actually just art center as the more the two institutes uh, that present Hong Kong artists' works. Of course, you may have some uh, commercial galleries as well. So it was not very easy for the young artists to present something out of the uh, grand narrative in the tradition. So uh, a group of artists actually yeah, get, gathered together to have a show. Um, there were many different uh, inside stories as well. But Later on, uh, you can also look into it uh, a bit more. So this is one of the this is one of the uh, this is a performance by Yang Sao Chan uh, at the opening. Uh, 
um, I, actually, he has some different opinion about the exhibition, <laughs> and he did a, a, a performance, in, um, yeah, uh, and wrapped himself in the cage for the for the day for two days at the opening and during the exhibition in response to the the the, the whole exhibition structure. But I'm not going to go into a lot of details of the show, just to want to show some visuals to let us jump from the modern art and ink painting to the now finally 80s, the contemporary. Um, so um, maybe the question was not formed exactly like this, but um, I kind of recapture it in my own style. Uh, OK, so a question from yesterday's discussion. Um, during the process of decolonization, is it objectively possible to throw away, you know, some some of the leftover structures of the colonial idea? Is it possible to actually remove it? Um, I, I think we want to refer to the negative <laughs> past. <laughs> not everything, not everything necessary. Um, and then pondering the question, I was thinking about that if it is already so because. If it is already in my body, if I'm already the product of the, this hybrid culture, I'm already, then how can I do it? If it is already part of my body, maybe I need to cut off my body parts. Maybe I just suicide. I need to be, you know, disappear. Um, but anyway, so um, in the yeah in the year of 2006 and 7, uh, Hong Kong's local movement actually chose selectively to keep some black over structures. Um, the, in this case, the, the Queen's Pier and the Star Ferry's uh, clock tower. Um, I think the, the, they are, it is a really difficult uh, question. It's not only about, uh, yeah, we want to keep the architecture from the colonial time. It is really like the British. It's not just that, right? But um, first of all, it's to recognize the history. I think this is one, part, one important part of it. and then. To anyone uh, who lives in this world, this globe, this is just to be environmental friendly, not to fill up more of the sea, the harbor. Um, and it is also interesting to see how the, the, the British actually um, fill up a lot of the, the ocean, uh, not only in Hong Kong, but also in other uh, colonies like Mumbai, in India, for example. Um, so um, it is uh, quite significant to show the local move movement from 2006 to 2007, because um, I also shared uh, about this yesterday, that before C and G, uh, actually, um, before 1997, we, we did see a lot of uh, exhibitions and artworks related to the politics and cultural identities of Hong Kong, and also reported a lot, like, world in world. But, and then after the handover, right after the handover, it seems to be really quiet. And we, certainly we don't need, it seems we don't need, it, in quotes, we don't need political artworks. And of course, um, it may not be necessary that all the artists stop making such works, stop thinking about it. Um, or maybe because no one is interested in reporting about it, writing about it, or showing it. Um, but then I think it's really interesting to see after 10 years, almost 10 years, 2006, 2007, then the more question about what local means actually come into the public sphere. Yeah, again, and due to a lot of different reasons. But, um, and so in the movement for protecting the Star Ferris Clock Tower and also the Queen's Sphere, a lot of artists and cultural practitioners, they also participate. And so the, the artists never were quiet. Maybe they were waiting for time to show up. Um, so I'm not your problem. Please save me. Uh, it's actually by uh, Yuan Yang and the X4 about loud. And also, um, yeah, some other installation. So uh, every weekend uh, during that time, before the Star Ferris Clock Tower was uh, removed, every weekend all the artists gather at the pier to do activities to raise the issue to the public. And eventually, it actually got a lot of attention from the public and got a lot of discussion, debate in the mass media. Uh, yeah, but the, the, in the end of the story, that is gone. <laughs> um, yeah, so quite close by, the Queen's Pier also 
uh, was demolished in 2007. Um, so this is actually the, the place where the, the, the queens and the government actually arrived and walked up, although they, they actually flew to Hong Kong, you know, and then they come to, to get to the shore again. <laughs> so this is quite symbolic. But, okay, we are not, I think it is not uh, just, it's not significant only uh, about this colonial history that we should recognize. But it, come on, it was a really nice public uh, space also for many people to <laughs> So, um, and then also about the harbor. So, um, uh, the local movement was about, you know, protecting it, trying to keep it. So, there was the demonstration occupation, also with a lot of artists as well. For example, uh, George Choi, and he or she was playing badminton, trying to play badminton with someone inside, hoping that the, 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 <laughs> yeah, they will come back ever. But, uh, of course, it doesn't work. Um, there's another piece by Le Fosang, is more um, subtle and quiet. She actually read one page of um, Mo Wasik, which is a, a, a novel by Sai Sai in the other years, and then burn it, and then burn it um, as an act. This is actually her statement. So with the demolish, demolish, uh, demolition of Queen's Pier, the memory of Aosing, my city, actually becomes vanished in void. I hope we could um, witness this joke of history. Come and let me read one page of the book and burn it into ashes for you. Don't misunderstand. This action is not out of anger. I only want to be with you to mark the amnesia of this city. So this is um, yeah, how she reacts to this whole uh, movement and also how to share the experience with another uh, protester. And in this video is particularly interesting because this man, he came here um, to voice his opinion against this preservation. Yeah, so there are yeah, always different opinions. And Lan Zhang was reading this uh, to him as well. So this is in 2013. Um, yeah, it's gone. So um, is it possible to throw away the leftover structures? If this is a question come, coming back to me again. And maybe it is not unless we actually all die. But um, this is, uh, I recently found this um, magazine Ji Fa from 2010. This is actually a literary magazine um, uh, with, a, uh, with most writers and, ed and editors who also participate in the Queen Spears uh, preservation movement. Okay, so um, in this issue, it says it will talk about the reason for Hong Kong's dying, the death of Hong Kong. So already in 2010, people were thinking about you know, the death of Hong Kong. <laughs> then, and I recently, um, last year actually, I did an act in response to some artist friends from Vancouver. They were trying to make a film, um, and in the film they interviewed different, many different people, including me. So they asked me if you have to leave Hong Kong for good what would be the last few things you want to do? I quite, I was quite exactly sure what it was. Um, so basically, I want to bury myself in the soil. And this is actually, um, I, because they are still editing the film, the, the, view, the film is not out yet, so I'm just showing you the making of, uh, of it. So it was three years after the Umbrella Movement. And I think my, my response to the whole um, situation Currently, nowadays, is, um, yeah, basically, this is the, the border. Um, this is Shenzhen. These are the fish ponds on the Hong Kong side. So there is this little hill yeah, that you, where you can have a really good view of it. And so what I did was to dig up a hole which is uh, long enough for myself. And I go down uh, into the soil and cover myself with the um, fabric, uh, brown fabric. Um, 
So I, I think yeah, later on, uh, I think the other uh, uh, participants in the panel they will explain even more about what they think of the maybe the, the quality and quantity uh, of the of the violence in this decolonization process. But um, I think uh, like the statements uh, by Lan Bosan, um, I'm not except, uh, express, especially especially angry. But I think this is maybe another peaceful way to give away something in the hope of maybe a rebirth. But then if rebirth is possible, um, or if rebirth is not possible, then maybe, hopefully, there's a, another afterlife. And, and so uh, I will end my presentation with one final project that CNG um, has, work, has been working on. Recently, um, so under the under the big structure of uh, the justice for West colonization, we have some um, strict actions uh, <laughs> recently, and this is one of the local. This is uh, imitating uh, you know the old medicine box in, in the Hong Kong in the old days, and so. Uh, in this series, one of it is about uh, it's called on um, fire, still so called. Uh, in this version, we basically invite different artists to make their own paper sculpture offerings to burn for the whoever in the other space. Um, and I think this is also a really good solution uh, to the space limitation in Hong Kong because after you make something really big. Just for it, you don't need the storage. This is actually a problem for a lot of artists in Hong Kong as well. So we quickly go to go through some images and then you will easily get what I mean. So this is it was the ghost festival in the calendar, July 14th. How you stop saying? Um so there were many artists together at the very beginning. Besides asking them to make um, you know in their own way. Uh, a paper sculpture to be burned. We also asked everyone to make a speak paper speaker. So in the end, it's still la baja. And yeah, so we we burn all the speakers together in the end. So you can maybe it is for the ghost who cannot speak, or maybe it is for something else you can interpret by yourself. Um, and for those who don't read Chinese necessarily, these two characters are by this uh, female artist called Freedom Jia. So she was burned up pretty young. And there's the big tiger in the front. Uh, it's like Fu Tao Zha, actually it's a knife in the old days to be used to, um, to get rid of the back officials. So this is, uh, yeah, I'll just quickly, because my time uh, is over, I think. And, and this artist, she, um, actually she got a book from her father's uh, bookshelf from Beijing, who's um, actually um, suggested by his friends who um, said that this book is actually a, a very good one for um, for, so, for the society's reform and read by a lot of the officials in the Communist uh, Party nowadays. And Rick Yu, he, I think he, he make it um, as a more a positive um, presentation in his work, uh, actually he asked every audience to get one of the fins from the fish. And then you can make a wish. After you make a wish, you can burn the fin. This, and he's I'm also referring um, this whole character, the fish and human. Um, um, first of all, with the um, pink dolphins in Hong Kong who are who are dying, and then another reference is actually the long character. Mm. Really, when you will uh, yeah. listen to more stories about long tank. And this is about the burning of the freedom. And because uh, it is so um, common to basically burn things, uh, burn offerings on the street in public space on the July 14th, so it was not really a big problem, not until we make a really big fire. <laughs> <laughs> then the police came and they worried. And then I said, no problem, this is the last piece. So it will be last week. Yeah, yeah. So uh, passes by will come. And yeah, so if there is the afterlife, um, then maybe 
we can, I think we, I, I am preparing myself to enter the liminal space to see if there can be something, you know, some other possibilities for the future. But uh, if there is no afterlife, then maybe we just vanish and void. But um, yeah. But I think you, um, there's one conversation I kind of I remember quite well from the umbrella movement. Um, is that a friend asked me, do you think you know? Um, do you think it will be successful? And then I I answered that um, actually no, I don't see that everyone is ready to give up anything. And if you don't really give up anything, how can change happen? So, but maybe mm, if we yeah try to yeah try to look at the, the whole world in a different way, maybe something else will come. And and then I after all these, I kind of I remember that um in one of the recent theater play um, about this Dominican character, which comes from a biblical story about the really long like in the old days, long long time ago, there is this um half human, half fish character living in the mental island. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so um, recently there's this uh, theater play about this character. And then the ending of it is also um, about all the long, long pain people. They cut off their body parts. They cut off their arms and legs. And yeah, I don't know. I, I never really talked to the director. The playwright and director, but then I think somehow along the way, um, maybe my uh, my response to my friend's Finn's questions um, is also kind of in the same line about thinking about the whole situation at the moment in Hong Kong. So I would just uh, yeah, I'll end it here for now, and maybe we can have more discussion later on. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, if there are some questions now or some comments, I think we can like quickly have them like not to like keep everything. So um, if there's anything that anyone would like to say now we can wait a little bit. If you want to think more about it, we can we can, you know, think about it and write it down and we, we do it during the closing session. No? Thank you so much. So I would like to uh, invite Yao Ting now on the uh, on the stage, and uh, she is a writer and artist, or ex-artist, <laughs> <laughs> and academic, or <laughs> ex-academic. Ex <laughs> and uh, well, some of her books uh, include As Normal as Possible, Negotiating Sexuality and Gender in Manchester and Hong Kong. Uh, filming Margins, Tang Chu Xun, a, for, a forgotten Hong Kong woman director, uh, and The Impossible Home. And her film and video works have been uh, exhibited in various museums and festivals uh, around the world. So, uh, the floor is yours. Sorry, I don't mind you. I, I hope you don't mind me sitting down uh, talking. I'm, I'm running out of tea. Um, having been here <laughs> for the past two days. Um, all right. Um, thank you. Um, I started um, thinking about today's presentation with the following questions in mind. Um, if the process of decolonization is contextually determined, what kind of decolonization process is Hong Kong going through these days? My take on the Hong Kong condition um, today, it would be quite different from what you just heard from Clara. Um, and, um, and I probably would run the risk of antagonizing all my friends in Hong Kong, which, you know, um, with my age, I kind of feel that I have that right to do so. Um, I also was curious about um, um, how do we get to this? How do we come to the, this condition? Um, it, what processes uh, lead us here? I would draw from photos I've taken in the past few years, before and during the umbrella movement, um, my travels in China, together with some reflection on my past video work. Um, in order to understand how this we come to where we are, I need first to ask maybe where I come from. 
One in Hong Kong I could be seen as roughly belonging to the generation of post World War II baby boomers who grew up during the Cold War and received my entire primary and secondary education in missionary schools. Although China was less than an hour away from the public housing project that I grew up in, formations of post 1949 China, its politics, its literature, its history have never appeared in any way in my formal education as if this country simply doesn't exist. In my schooling as an art student, um, number four, as some of you may know, one could be either in the arts or in the science stream in Hong Kong, secondary school. History in English, history, that subject in English, actually means world history, which basically means European history, uh, was a compulsory subject. While Chinese history as a subject um, you know, has to be qualified as Chinese history, taught in Chinese, was optional. The world history and the Chinese history subjects gave me a completely different worldview, a different version of the Opium War. The former, the world history subject, about resolved trade conflicts through the war. The latter, the Chinese history subject, about invasion and about unequal treaties. Narratives of China in both subjects, though, ended at 1949. Um, faced with the imminent danger, the imminent danger, imminent future of Hong Kong being returned to China, I made a video in the 1990s entitled The Esperama Dagger um, in Zaitong, uh, in which I took out as much as the, as much the color red I possibly could. So everybody especially Chinese political leaders, look green or blue. <laughs> um, in the video, subjects were asked or asked themselves, do I identify as being Chinese or as Hong Konger? They are Zhongguo and they are Hong Kong. Diaspora was represented in the video as a condition produced by the impossibility of fully identifying as either. Um, and of course, I myself at the time identified with the diasporic condition. Interviewees also discussed on camera the possibility of Hong Kong gaining independence, which was actually very much a taboo subject in Hong Kong under the colonial rule. Um, for some of you who may not be old enough to ex have experienced the colonial regime, actually it was much more a taboo subject at the time than now. Um, much to my surprise, um, oh, okay, Hong Kong interviewees, let me just finish this interviewees on camera, they disappeared, uh, uh, discussed on camera. All right, um, much to my surprise, a Hong Kong-based Chinese online press did an article and a follow-up documentary last year, seeking out and re-interviewing my interview subjects 20 years ago as part of their feature on 20th anniversary of Hong Kong's handover. My video was then invited by a pro-democratic legislator to a community screening in order to initiate a discussion on Hong Kong's current political problems. Now this video suddenly received a second life. When it first came out, it was shown in Hong Kong, but that's about the end of it. But then it suddenly had a rebirth 20 years later. So this process forces me to come to face, to come face to face with the fact that the internalized colonization of my generation, with all its depoliticized confusion, its lack of historical knowledge, and knowledge of international power relations, clinging onto correctly aligned liberal values, democracy, equality, freedom, and therefore obsessed naturally with identity politics, has very much contributed to reproducing the current generation who poses to decolonize. When I say reproduce, I'm literally reproducing because actually the present young generation would be the age of my daughters and sons if I have them. Um, and this kind of decolonization has internalized so much coloniality that it serves to perpetuate it while it claims at the same time to challenge it. In June, um, 2014, the Chinese government released a white paper affirming Beijing's comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong. About 500,000 people talking to the streets 
following the biggest protests since 2003. One would assume this was a protest demanding universal suffrage, but the imagery we saw said a lot more. Like in the two previous marches under Sivailo's administration, there were protesters, maybe more visible than ever, waving the British Hong Kong flag, showing the resentment to the post handover situation. This protester, for example, not only wears the flag on his tee, but also takes the time and the energy to color match his outfit. So all this emotional investment that goes into it. Different groups evoke images from the British colonial governance as the preferred administration, conflating it with or protecting onto it, or projecting onto it, a desire to be so-called autonomous, which of course talks back to the British, uh, to the Chinese white paper. While they call for society, Hong Kong for Hong Kongers, to be politically autonomous here means to some or at one extreme, to be exclusive, nativist, ethnocentric, and paradoxically, or when we say perversely, ruled by the British colonial regime again. What was visible as one voice among many on the July 4th March in 2014 became a major force several months later, feeding into actually an ad hoc activist outburst, which we now call the Umbrella Movement, also sometimes known as the Umbrella Revolution by the English press. Here again, to some, to be ruled by colonizers is a source of pride and ethnic superiority, which marks one's off from the ethnic other, which of course are the mainlanders, here called the locust Wang Chong, or yellow insects. From bad to worse, is this perverse enough? <laughs> but one needs to see from these images that the urge to be British again, Hong Kong is British, is also packaged with overwhelmingly liberal values quote, peaceful, rational, as if it's a voting choice. The words, quote, truly, unquote, and smart, unquote, reveal the protesters' critique of the Hong Kong pan-democratic movement in the past two decades, which emphasized peaceful and rational actions. This poster calls all Hong Kong citizens and, and, and on Hong Kongers as a race, newly formed to vote in a referendum inviting the UK to resume sovereignty over Hong Kong. Christian values are as omnipresent as liberal values in Hong Kong's political activism right now. The mission of the church is the mission of Christ, unquote. This poster board under the Hong Kong British flag quotes from Bonds of Affection, which is of course resolutions of the sixth meeting of the Anglican Consultative Council held in Nigeria to seek to transform unjust structures of society, da -di -da. So this is definitely not meant to be perverse. In fact, it came to right the wrong to normalize perversity. Who then is perverse? In this imaginary universe, it is the other side. Communism was always perverse. This checklist compares and contrasts between religion proper, with communism, rendering it as an evil religion, because it preaches a godless view and opposes traditional morality. So suddenly you see Christianity, Christian values, being aligned with traditional morality, which is a kind of Christianity I didn't really know of. <laughs> In this particular context, an anti-communist rhetoric is often fueled by anti-China sentiments and vice versa. This is a game inviting participants to whip or stack on the Chinese white paper. Sometimes China is represented as fake communist, Aigong, as if distinguishing the regime from the discourse, but then its party state structure, Daonghua, often characterized with greed and corruption, Tafu, has been seen increasingly as a negative force polluting or so-called reddening Tefa, Hong Kong, in which case Fear or hatred of communism is signified by fear or hatred of the color red. Doesn't this sound familiar? Something similar to I, a video that I just mentioned 20 years ago? While this so-called Hong Kong autonomy movement or the localist in Hopi was more visible than publicly verbal at this time in history, serving perhaps only as an undercurrent in 2014, gathered much more will and sentiment via the failure of the umbrella movement. It strives to replace the historical pan-democracy movement 
from the past decades as the most popular oppositional force right now after the Alibaba movement, especially among the younger generation, as it has also been driven increasingly underground by recent arrest, imprisonment, and disqualification of pro-localist elected senators. As things stand now, China as see, is seen as the culprit fed by an evil discourse called communism. What is this anti-Chinese, anti-China discourse then fed by? How is this constructed? Part of it, I would argue, comes from the Cold War. A rhetorical system of global power structure built on the binary opposition of good states versus bad states, evil states, freedom versus totalitarianism, liberal versus liberal and progressive versus backward or barbaric, Christian versus the rest. Taiwan, as the US following Chinese representative, becomes a role model that many Hong Kong youngsters look up to. It is in this context that perhaps you may be able to ask again, to what extent has Hong Kong culture and our self imaginary been shaped by the Cold War rhetoric, but was rarely seen as such. Why rarely? Because our internalization of the Cold War was masked by a form of capitalist coloniality, which has deeply depoliticized and re-racialized, re-ethnicized us in such a way that any form of activism or resistance could only be formulated without an awareness of past struggles and without an awareness of colonial history. In the in Fuzhou, the Opium War was represented not only as a foreign invasion, which resulted in colonialism, colonialism was also emphasized as epitomizing the essential need of Western capitalism to grow, of which Britain was a key rack at the time, through relentlessly seeking out raw materials and new commodities. As a self-sufficient natural economy, quote, China kept two of three million silver surplus per year in trade with Britain up until before the Opium War. It was the opium trade that turned the tables around, while China sought to stop it, be it Britain attacked. The fleet leader who forced the Tang government to sign the Unequal Treaty of Nanjing became Hong Kong's first governor, Henry Pottinger. Um, world systems analysis among others, um, um, Samir Amin, for example, has helped to demystify the supposed distinctions between the three formations respectively, called society, economy, and politics. Capitalism, according to World Systems Analysis, is fundamentally imperialistic, as it perpetuates itself in reprodu reproducing the world into a system of unequal relations between the center or the core and its peripheries. It was European colonialism that has supported, if not legitimized, its ideology of progress, as well as its exploitation of liberal values to the rest of the world. The resistance against this, liberal, uh, this globalizing system produces the leftist and later developed into the communist Chinese revolution, whose slogan at the time was the three NTs, anti-feudal, anti-capitalist, and anti-imperialistic. Anti-imperialistic meaning anti-colonial. This also led to China's being isolated and or stigmatized for half of the last century. Its lingering form we still see around the Euro-American dominated information networks today. So Hong Kong is British, quote and unquote, means we have been taught to and should be capable of as Hong Kongers, if not already. Catching up with the West is capitalism, is modernity, is liberal values, so much so that we have to align with them, with the Europe, American core, and not with that evil other, China, the periphery. In order to get out of this oppositional relation, one needs to at least learn from and readdress history, I think, global relations and its violence, from perhaps, for a change, a Chinese-based perspective. Without this historical understanding, I think it's very hard to unpack the co complexity of the Hong Kong condition today, which is a direct product of a very long and one may say perverse, or actually I would say pretty normal, but either way definitely very successful process of colonization, which has worked hand in hand with its best friend, capitalism, to colonize all space in Hong Kong by turning it into no space. 
<laughs> Our capitalist coloniality has looted and commodified all land and space into unusable, unlivable fake space until it's paid for, for a very high price. Now, this is an art piece that I just read two days ago before this conference, and I loved it. It is a commissioned art piece by the Hong Kong government, of course, and it's called Safe Island in Kwai Fong. And um, it basically filled the sidewalk with bricks, <laughs> making it entirely unusable. And of course, like severely complained by the neighborhood, um, saying that it even like, basically blocked passengers from uh, crossing the, walk, the road. Um, but because its title, Safe Island, I think is such a good parodic piece for Hong Kong, which basically right now, yes, we probably has nothing left but safety. <laughs> um, one remarkably utopian characteristic of the Umbrella Movement was, I think, is reclaiming public space in the most commercialized areas of Hong Kong, temporarily. Talking back to a society and its politics of long lost publicness. If one has to stage, but I mean, some of the you know, former students that I picnic with during the umbrella movement are also here. Um, but if one has to stage an exceptional protest setting in order to realize one's public desires, it's just, I think, too much. Or it's just not enough, not perverse enough. <laughs> A few weeks after the umbrella movement, practically, actually, you know, within maybe two or three weeks after the umbrella movement, I. Um, submitted my, re my re reservation letter um, to my full-time job and resigned from actually the best job I've ever had at um, uh, Nanyang University. So I retired from full-time teaching and moved on to doing part-time or freelance space, sometimes in Hong Kong and sometimes in China. It was in China that I find myself easily bathed in a sense of publicness anywhere, anytime. Finding people doing all kinds of weird things in unexpected places, including, for example, outside of university where I was teaching in the library, people would appropriate the campus for their own private use, picnicking, playing with kids, sunbathing, swimming in the pond, uh, river, whatever, and um, peeing sometimes, or talking to statues, uh, doing public performances. Um, or inside the library, where I work a lot, you will also see people doing umbrella movements. Um, I actually am not sure what the student is doing there, but I, I watched her for a long time, and I think she's cooking. <laughs> doing challenging exercise in public parks. Playing orchestral music. Kite flying as a spectacle, drinking tea in the middle of the streets <laughs> endlessly from 6 a.m. to 3 a.m. Drinking tea in the middle of the streets. This is actually, um, well, anyway, introduced to me by a taxi driver <laughs> in, in Shanghai when I was there. Tangoing, tangoing with heterosexual or uh, heterosocial or sometimes homosocial partners. Um, kicking, a game that I used to play with when I was small, but you can't see in Hong Kong anymore, shuttlecock. Or we saw you know, it from Clara's presentation, playing badminton in Hong Kong, only during protest times. But in China, you see it in the streets almost every day. <laughs> playing chess, playing cards, different kinds of games. Sitting or just sitting around doing nothing. Or maybe most perversely, I would say, getting into a plastic ball, zipped up, and then play a struggling game inside it when it is floating on a pond. You may not understand what this by looking at my manipulated images, but this is what it is. <laughs> Now, if you were as westernized and as colonized as myself, you may be watching on a pond. I was obsessed with this image for half an hour, no less. <laughs> and I shot tons of images and video with my phone. 
on it. So that's why I had all those images. <laughs> yeah, because I was horrified watching it, thinking that either the kid would be suffocated <laughs> or the, the, bub the bubble would leak and then the kid would be drowned. So you get all kinds of like, horror fantasies because of my upbringing and my uh, makeup. But in China, obviously, this kid was having a lot of fun. He was indeed enjoying himself for half an hour. And everybody watching didn't have the same reaction as I did. At these activities, that could be easily considered by calculus modernity as too risky, too private, too anarchic. We don't see China as anarchic usually these days. We see it as totalitarian. But I can tell you that I think it's exactly this strange combination of anarchism and totalitarianism and total control together. And I think they mutually reproduce each other. And it's exactly this combination which makes China extremely fascinating and very productive nowadays. <laughs> You can also say it's barbaric, unproductive, unmanageable, or even queer. So I'm just suggesting that we may need to shift our perspective a little bit in order to get out of this vicious cycle of the colonial and the decolonization process mutually reproducing each other. Until we acknowledge other kinds of freedom, social equality, and democratic self-ownership, other than those already defined for us by capitalist liberal values. We may not have begun to, I think, decolonize. And we wouldn't have any imagination or self-imagination to even begin to do so. Thank you.